it is good to be back. I want you to turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And um, it's just kind of weird being the uh, guest uh, speaker at the church you pastor. It's kind of weird, you know. But man, haven't Pastor Matt and Pastor Edgar been doing an incredible job bringing the word? I wouldn't know because I had told the board, I'm like backing out, I'm not even watching the services, just trying to be good at this. Uh, but uh, thank you for those of you who are illegally sending me texts, let me know what's going on. That's good, I like that. <laughs> you know, a lot of people asking me, you know, hey, how's, you know, I run into people at Costco or whatever, how's sabbatical going? Uh, how's sabbatical going? You know, how are things? And, 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 and so, you know, I, we've had some, some good things, but like if a picture is worth a thousand words, um, really at the end of the day, my sabbatical is kind of going like this. Let's see the first picture. Uh, can you, I think we have a second picture. Uh, oh yeah, there's a third picture. Um, literally all of those vehicles since I, uh, since I left, uh, check engine light came on and th those pictures are staged. You don't have to start praying for us or give us a car or anything, but, but the check engine light has come on and I have spent more time with my head under the hood, which doesn't do anything for my vehicle. I'm just like, hmm, I, I don't know, but what, what, what I, I love about the check engine light though, it's, 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 it's one of those things you're glad it comes on. And for, the, for some of you are like, you know, I have the most beautiful dash light, all these orange lights everywhere. Those are actually not supposed to be there. Like you need to do something about that. But a check engine light is, is something that brings awareness that, that things are not as they should be. And, and you're supposed to pay attention to those things so that on down the road, you don't break down. And, and what I love is that the Holy Spirit, God and his grace, the Holy Spirit will trigger, if you will, check engine lights for us for the very same reason. Because on down the road, he doesn't want us to break down. In fact, it, I think it's good for us to acknowledge that, that God wants our good more than we want our good. God wants us to be who he's called us to be more than we want that. And I think there are times when the Holy Spirit in, in his grace and his goodness and he convicts us of things, we, we take that the wrong way. We take it as criticism or, or God must be unhappy with me. No, God is for you. And in his grace, he's triggering that check engine light and saying, I've got something here. Let's do something about it. As we jump into 1 Corinthians chapter three, we're picking up where Pastor Matt left off last week. And he introduced the series, 1 Corinthians, and uh, talked about the problem that is facing this church, this, this issue of disunity. Now, it, it's not the, it's probably the first time, it's not the first time the church faced that. It's not the last time the church has faced that. And we don't know this for sure, but just the way that 1 Corinthians is written, there is probably a letter that Paul had received from the elders in the church saying, we've got some problems here because he is addressing specific things. And, and, and so what, what we know is that this disunity is manifesting itself in a lot of, in a lot of ways. People are fighting, uh, they're, they're arguing with one another, and, and it's not a good arguing, it's a bad arguing. There's sexual misconduct within the church. There's all kinds of uh, crazy things happening. And, and in fact, they've got to the place that they've even started to drift a little from just the basics of Christianity. And so what Paul is going to do through this letter is just bring them back. And he does this by doing what he does at the beginning of almost every letter that he writes by, by reminding them of who they are. Because identity is a huge thing. What's your identity? And so what he does, and if, if you look at chapter one, verse two, he reminds them, you are sanctified in Christ Jesus. You're called to be saints. And, and, and like when he uses that language, immediately there's a standard that goes along with that, right? For better, for worse, if your neighbor or whoever, they find out that, that you're a Christian, they have some expectations, our family has this joke that anytime we go on vacation, doesn't matter where we are in the country, I am going to run into someone I know or there's some connection there. And so a few weeks ago, Lori and I 
As part of our sabbatical, we had scheduled a vacation and we took a cruise to Alaska. And uh, on, you know, we're getting ready to leave the cruise and uh, one, of, one of my kids was like, I guarantee you, you're gonna run into somebody you know. I'm like, no. Like we are, we're on a cruise ship. It's not a Christmas cruise. We're just, we're going there. Literally, like I am not gonna talk to anybody. Yeah, right. And uh, within two days, I'd met somebody that works with one of my best friends from college, we toured around and, and quartet together and all this sort of thing. And, and, and so we walked away from conversation and Lori's kind of joking. She's like, well, I guess you're not gonna be spending time in the casino on this ship. Uh, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> and the reason she said that, not that I would anyway, but her, her point that she was making was is that, that whole thing. When, when somebody knows that you're a pastor, knows that you're, Let's just, he's basic, a Christian, there are, and I believe should be expectations that go along with that. And so he, he brings them back to, to who they are and, and, and he's, he's doing this at the very beginning, but then he, because he has a legal mind, he, he's laying the foundation for where he's gonna go with the rest of his, his teaching, with addressing these problems. He introduces two general types of people. Uh, if you look at chapter one, verse 18, there are those who are perishing. This is the natural man. In fact, in chapter two, he's gonna give us uh, more, uh, you know, more insight in this. He, he talks in, in, in verse uh, well, 14 of chapter two, he says, the natural man does not accept the things of the spirit of God for they are folly to him. He's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Listen, this is who we are naturally. This is how we're born. We're not born just like, oh yeah, man, we got, we've got this. Like right now, your little kids back in nursery, they are, they are of the flesh. I'm telling you right now. Okay. So, so, so he, he, so there's this, and then he introduces them again in, in chapter two to another general type of person. This is the spiritual person, the person who is alive in Christ, able to receive spiritual wisdom as, and he points this out. You can look, I'm not gonna read it. Chapter two, verse six, verse 13. And so, so we have two general types of people, a person who is not in Christ. They're not a believer. They are the natural person. They have not been brought from death to life as Paul writes later in Ephesians two. And then we have the person who has been brought alive. They are in Christ. They have been saved. Now, what he's going to do though, because he's, he is writing to people who are in Christ. Even with all of the problems, he's reminding them at the beginning. Yeah, you got these problems, but remember, remember who you are. You are saints. You are sanctified. You've been set apart to God. And so then he's gonna, he's gonna draw some other distinctions in this category of those who are alive in Christ. And so I'm just gonna tell you right now, I'm gonna be talking to people this morning who are Christians who have been saved. And so if you are here and you're not a believer, first of all, love that you're here. Love that you're here. Man, keep coming back. Man, we, we have the most loving people here in the world. You're, you're gonna love your time here. But, but I, I wanna talk to Christians. So like, even if you're not a believer, just tune in because there, there might be some things like, oh, so, so that's what this means here. But, but I, I wanna talk to believers here because we're gonna talk about some check engine lights this morning when it comes to these things. And so... We get into chapter three, verse one, after he set the table and here's what we read. He said, but I brothers could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you're not, you're not yet ready for you are still of the flesh. He's addressing something that, that shows up in chapter one. He said, for, for while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? And then in verse four, he introduces the issue behind this. We're gonna get into that here in, in just a second. But what Paul is doing, he's saying, okay, there's this disunity. And it's not just this issue between people who are unbelievers and people who are believers. No, this issue of disunity is between believers, but he's drawing a distinction. Even here, there's a difference between those who are spiritually mature and those who are spiritually immature. There are those who he says are still infants in Christ. You're still of the flesh. Maybe you're, the version of the Bible you use uses the word carnal. 
This is just saying, man, you're, you're spiritually mature, which don't, don't like get offended. Like, oh, you can't tell me I'm spiritually. Hold on. That's, it's not a bad thing. Like we have to be made aware of, of the standard. We have to be made aware of what God's called us to for us to move forward. You know what I'm saying? So this is actually a good thing. And I, I think it's good for us to acknowledge that maturity, does just, it just doesn't happen overnight. In fact, think of being saved this way. When we're saved, it's as if the Holy Spirit invaded the enemy territory of, of your life. Jesus Christ became uh, king. He, he took possession of, uh, of the capital city of, of your heart, if you will. A few years ago, I read, I, I'm a huge uh, fan of World War II history. I love, uh, love studying World War II history and uh, came across uh, this book. And I can't remember the exact title. I should have looked it up. Um, but I, I remember it was, it was about uh, when President Truman followed uh, FDR as president during World War II and everything that went behind, uh, you know, designing, creating the atomic bomb, and then everything that he and his advisors had to weigh out when it came to, do we actually drop this bomb on, on Japan? It's a, it was a fascinating behind the scenes look at this. And for those of you that, that you know, know this, that remember a few details from history class when you were in high school, you know that, uh, that when we dropped the, the atomic bomb, this literally changed the course of the war. In fact, the, yeah, Japan surrendered on September 2nd, 1945. World War II comes to an end, but that didn't mean the fighting stopped. In fact, just about a month ago, I was reminded of this. I was listening to a podcast about the last Japanese soldier to surrender. His name was Hiro, uh, what was it, uh, Anada. He'd been deployed to Lubang in, in the Philippines. And it's a little island. And, and they told him, as, as they dropped him off, they said, we need you and this company to hold the island until the Japanese uh, infant, uh, army returns. And over the years, they lost uh, all, all of his company except this guy. Here's a crazy thing. He had no idea that the war had ended. And for 30 years, he fought guerrilla warfare on this island. He did not surrender until 1974. Can you imagine? 1974, this guy, for 30 years, he's keeping up the fight. And I want to use Hero as, a, as an example here. Just because Jesus Christ became king, it doesn't mean the, the war in the big sense ended. It doesn't mean the fighting stops. For those of us that think that, that man, oh, I'm, I'm saved now. I have been transformed and all things have, have become new. Yeah, they have in one degree in a spiritual sense, but the enemy is still going to fight. He hasn't just said, oh, well, I guess he belongs to God. So let's just, you know, I'm gonna go find somebody else. No, no, he's going to keep fighting. But the Holy Spirit and his conviction of sin, as we respond, he does this purifying work of, of transforming us, of changing us, of maturing us. And he does this in, in unique ways. And by the way, his cleanup operations do not look the same in person to person. This is why Paul later is gonna say, do not compare yourself with somebody else. Like, don't, don't look as like, huh, well, well, they're doing that. I better do what they're doing. That might not be what your next step happens to be. God knows what your next step is. But the reality is he's going to do this cleanup work. He's going to transform. But I, I think it's important that we understand that just because there is spiritual immaturity, it doesn't mean that there is the absence of spiritual life. And for those of you here are hopeless and you're like, man, I, I thought that if I was saved that the fighting was gonna stop or I thought I'd be further up the road than I am today. Man, we all thought we were gonna be in the NBA making $30 million, but here we are. You know what I'm saying? Same thing's true spiritually. Same thing tr is true spiritually. And so don't confuse the fact that, 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 it, that I, you know, because I'm, I'm rest with these things that may, man, maybe I'm not in Christ. No, it's just the Holy Spirit is pointing things out. He's, he's reminding you, you are sanctified. 
You're, you're set apart to God. You're saints, which a saint is not, you know, some dead person who did some miraculous things and now they're deified. No, a saint is a living person who is in Christ. You are called a saint before you actually live up to what the title really is. Because that's what the Holy Spirit does. He goes about, we're not going to be perfect in this life, but he does a work of perfecting. And thank God that he who began a good work in you and I is gonna finish it one day. But until then, man, don't give up. What I'm gonna to share today is good news. These check engine lights, they're good news. I also think it's important that we understand that age and maturity don't increase at the same rate. Um, it was pointed out to me by my wife on July 4th that this is true. A group of us got together and they lit fountains and they were about this high and we decided to have a contest to see who could jump over the fountain without getting burnt. And your pastor did participate in this challenge. There may or may not be video of this, but anyway, um, on the way home, I felt the judgment. You know, it's just not that I, it's like, you're not 20 anymore. It's, it's, it's actually this, you're not 40 anymore. Like that hurt, like, that's, that's this deep. No, but in all seriousness, there are a lot of times that we just assume that if, if we have white hair, it means that we're spiritually mature. It's not true. Some of the most spiritually immature people I've met are old people. <laughs> And so like, I'm not dogging anybody. I'm just saying that let's not fall into this trap that, that, that age and, and spiritual maturity go hand in hand. No, what we're gonna see is he, he all of us, all of us, he, he wants to change. You've heard me say it a million times. You're gonna hear me say it another million times when I come back. If you're not dead, God's not done. Everybody has the next step to take. He, he's gonna grow us. But I would also say that, 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 that spiritual maturity isn't just you adhering to some religious code, some external code and dressing a certain way or doing certain things. That literally, you, you can be the most moral person in the world. You can be, you know, you, you know wh whatever, whatever we think this code has to be and, and still be spiritually immature. I remember I was, at a, when I was a kid, a little kid at a church, they'd had an invitation one night and, so, and people had come forward to, they'd responded and there was a person who'd never been to church before, been transformed. It was really cool. God, God saved them. There was this evidence, but all, on the way out as, as they were leaving, there was a person in the church and I was just happened to be standing there that, that caught them as they were going out the door and they said, if you, we noticed you went forward and you prayed and if, if God really changed you, when you come back, you're gonna look like this, you're gonna do this and all this sort of thing. And like, I, I would have missed out on that that is messed up if it wasn't for our pastor, which he's one of my heroes, Mark Mowry. He was, he overheard this person say this and he stepped in, pushed the person aside and said, do not listen to what they just said. You just follow the Lord, let God do what he's gonna do. And that person left. And then I'm still standing there like, like a, and I heard our pastor tell this person, don't you ever do that again. That's not your role. That's what God does. But I think that there are times that we just think, well, if I just look like other people that I think are spiritual people, then, then we're good. That's not maturity. No, what, what maturity is, 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 is gonna look different from, from person to person. It's just this whole thing. We're gonna move from infancy, from, the, from, <laughs> from spiritual adolescence, if you will. It, you know, th there's going to be increasing maturity, but it's gonna happen not because we did all of these things, these religious duties and checked the boxes. No, it's the Holy Spirit's going to put on those check engine lights. Now, I want you to grab my big point because this is good for, for both the cocky as well as the depressed and hopeless, okay? So get my big point. Spiritual maturity isn't automatic. And so, so for those of you that feel like you've missed out, hold on, man, God's, God's not done with you. But then for those of you like, well, I've arrived, God's not done with you. He, there's still work that he wants to do. You see, immaturity's motto is simply this, it's all about me. It's, it's all about me. And, and what we're gonna see as we continue to go through 1 Corinthians is at the heart of this disunity, at what, what, you know, what is manifesting this, this spiritual immaturity is, is the fact that it's, it's all about them. 
And that's why even as in these first three verses here in chapter three, it's, it's as if Paul is, is running some diagnostics here and there's some check engine lights that are coming up. And so listen, what I'm gonna share is, is from the word here in 1 Corinthians and what, where we'll be going to 1 Corinthians. But these check engine lights that, that, that I'm gonna bring up aren't necessarily, I mean, this is not exhaustive. Because what I believe will take place is that God in his grace this morning is actually gonna bring awareness like, hey, you know, here's, here's an area in which I want you to grow. You know, this whole thing of taking a sabbatical, uh, I, I think I expected, you know, just this great time of refreshing and revival and it was gonna be awesome. And, and I still got time for that to happen, but mostly it's been God saying, yeah, I wanna, I wanna deal with this. I wanna deal with that. I'm like, oh man, like, well, when does the refreshing part happen, God? That's what I'm looking for. But no, I look back, actually, this is just part of what God does because there are times that we just run on high and we ignore the check engine lights. Today, can we just pay attention to this? And there are a few that I'm just gonna bring up that, that Paul raises. First of all, I would ask you this question. Is my comfort more important than my calling? You see, growth understands, gr growth requires understanding who we're called to be. We're called to be holy. There's a standard. Now, uh, this past, on Friday, uh, Trey, my, my oldest son, got married. It was awesome. Um, it was great, and I'm very happy for them. But it was weird as I, I was helping officiate the ceremony, as I was standing up there, I don't know how else to put it, I had all these like weird video clips that start start coming to my head of like things that happened in Trey's life from a little kid all the way through teen years. And I don't know for those of you that you've seen your kids get married, if you've been through that or not, but it was weird. In that moment, I just had all these weird flashbacks that were happening. And one, one of the flashbacks that, that I, I remembered is this uh, well-dressed, uh, you know, carefully manicured guy walked down the aisle was when he was 13 and was not that guy. Like, like from, from Trey being born till age 13, I'm pretty sure he never combed his hair. Like, like ever. Like, it was like, like, I mean, it was just like, it was, it was crazy. So, so we, we did this thing when he turned 13, I, I took him out and it was this whole thing. like, hey, bro, you are like transitioning from being a boy to a young man. And there are some standards that go along with being a young man. So I took him to, uh, to uh, I think it was sports clips because he, I think he got the MVP treatment. He really liked the hot towel. He thought that was the coolest thing. He's like, mom's not cutting my hair. This is amazing. And so, uh, so you know, we, we did that whole thing. And then I took him out to steakhouse, let him order whatever he wanted, which cost me. And then we had this conversation. I said, okay, bro, a few expectations. You're a young man. You're not a kid anymore. And I'm holding you to a standard. So I'm not, gonna be, I'm not gonna be your coach. I'm gonna be your counselor. I'm not gonna be over your, you know, I'm not gonna be, you know, dictating your life, but I got some expectations. First of all, when you get out of bed, make your bed. Number two, when you wake up and you, after you made your bed, look around. All that laundry tray that is all over your floor, there is a basket that we bought and put in your room. Hey, come on, put in there. By the way, uh, husbands, you might learn from this too. This is amazing. This is good. And uh, then I said, what I want you to do, I said, we buy toothpaste to be used. I want you to brush your teeth every morning. I bought, that night I went out and bought him uh, deodorant. I said, you put it on every single day. He's like, what if I haven't sweat? I said, you're sweating, trust me. Put on deodorant. And I said, I want you to look in the mirror and I want you to comb your hair. I said, I better, I, I, I never want you from this day forward to have a day where you just go to school looking like you're just, you know, the whole rooster thing going on. And, uh, and like two weeks later, he came and he was like, dad, like it takes so much time to do all this. I'm like, exactly. Like you can't get out like five minutes before we leave. Hey. And, and like when Trey wakes up, he wakes up more like my wife was like, you know, when you're walking, he said, he said, man, he said, I just hate standing in front of the mirror and taking all that time and, and looking. And I'm like, bro, it's just part of growing up. And can I tell you that it's part of growing up as a Christian to look in the mirror? James 1 says the mirror is the word of God. And he says this, he said, it's, it's ludicrous 
for you to look at the word of God, to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. That's, that's how God's gonna speak and to just walk away and not do anything about it. He said, it's just as ludicrous as a person to look in the mirror, to see what needs to be fixed, to walk away. He, he, says, he says, be not just hearers of the word, be doers of the word. And here's what Trey found out, but here's what you're gonna find out when you stand in front of the mirror of the word of God. It won't always be comfortable. It's easier to stay where you are than it is to move forward, but you will never move forward if you stay where you are. Is my comfort more important than my calling? Do I have a hero more influ influential than Jesus? I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here, but, but here, here's the big thing that's manifested here is you look at chapter one, they're all fighting over who it is that they identify with. They're finding their identity in spiritual leaders and preachers and, and pastors and elders and evangelists than they are Jesus. You know, they're fighting over, oh, I'm with Apollos. Well, I'm with Paul. Well, I, I follow Cephas, so I'm Peter. And, and, and Paul's like, man, well, what is your problem, guys? He's like, man, was this guy crucified for you? I, I, I mean, in whose name were, were you baptized? Here's the thing. Hero worship was, was happening back then. Can I tell you, man, I, I am so sick and tired of, of Christian celebrity movement. I, I literally am. And, and, and by the way, that includes any, anybody that tries to make somebody else a celebrity. Dude, we are in Christ. There, there is all heroes pale in comparison to Jesus Christ. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like, like, like if, 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 you're, if you, you find your identity in being a Calvinist, God help you. If you find your identity in being a Wesleyan or an Arminian or a Charismatic or whatever the label happens to be, God help you. It's time for us to move past labels and just say we're in Christ. We're sanctified. We're set apart to Christ. That's who we are. And that's enough. Does theology matter? Yes, we're gonna see it in just a second. Should we go deep? Yes. But when we find our identity in what we're studying, Rather than in who Christ is, we've missed the boat. Do I have a hero more influential than me and Jesus? If, if, you're, fighting your, uh, if, you're, if you're fighting yourself a uh, disciple of anything else, dude, it's in trouble. I mean, was Franklin Graham crucified with you? I, for you, I don't think so. Were you baptized in the name of John MacArthur? No. If so, hey, we can have another one. I think we got one. Anyway, we'll, we'll do it all over again, but no. No, like, like the spiritually immature find other people and they put their confidence in people rather than Christ. Never gonna happen. Like, like, like myself, Matt, Edgar, whoever's on staff that you see preaching, don't put your confidence in us, first and foremost. You know, well, it's like, whoa, oh man, what kind of pastors are you? Well, no, no, here's what I'm saying. We're gonna mess up. In fact, at the end of every year, in fact, they're, they're recording right now. They take our, our beautifully, wonderfully encouraging media people take the clips of us saying stupid things and they put together a montage video at the end of the year that is hilarious. <laughs> and you will never see that video. But anyway, my, <laughs> my point is, is this, heroes will let you down. It's Jesus that matters. It's Jesus that matters. And, and, and this, is, this is what will mature. Right, okay, check engine lights. Number three, am I hungrier for junk? Or I would even say, going beyond that, I, I use junk here. I, I, am I hungry for junk or just milk that I am spiritual nutrition? This is what he's talking about. Okay, so milk is good. When he said, I, I, I fed you with milk, not solid food, you weren't ready for it. Um, milk is a good thing, okay? It's not like that is bad because milk is uh, what we need in the spiritual emphasis. It's really the, the basics of Christianity. Now, there are times we can't even swallow the milk because of pride. Pride is what chokes us. But, but, but the milk is a, it's, it's, it's the teaching that I think uniquely, uh, you know, it's uniquely designed to get the proud sinner started on a path of humility and hope. So, so milk is a good thing. But, but just like, like you would be worried about your kid if, if they just never stop with just milk, they wouldn't have anything else. It, the, the same thing is true. We need solid food. We need the meat. Vegetarians, we need the meat. No, I'm teasing, I'm teasing. Uh, sorry, Tom. Um, 
But no, but no, no, I'm talking about the solid food. If you go back to chapter two, I think the, the solid food is what he's referring to when he was talking about how the Holy Spirit teaches us the depths of God. These are the deeper, harder things to grasp. We need to go deeper. We need to go beyond just a simple thing. Oh, this is what it means to, to get saved. We need to understand what sanctification is all about, what God has called us to do, to understand, man, who God is as creator, who God is as our designer, who God is as, as, as Lord, who, you know, who God is as, you know, the, as revealed in the Old Testament, New Testament. But, but here's the thing I want to say. We, we can't find our identity in the fact that we're eating the meat. You know what I'm saying? It, it, because, in fact, one of the first books they gave me in seminary uh, at Liberty University was a book on how to keep your faith while going through seminary. And you're like, well, that's weird. No, the reason they did that was they have seen people who get so caught up in the pursuit of knowledge that they substitute knowledge for intimacy with the Savior. And so, so I, I wanna be really clear here that there's a difference that we must grow. We need to move on to solid food to understand the depths of God. But even then, we've gotta be careful. The check engine light comes on where we find our identity. Oh, well, I know these things. No, it's not your knowledge that matters. It's, man, am I applying this? Is, 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 you know, is God growing me, maturing me? Am I, am I more than just a hearer? Am I a doer? Does it make sense? I think it's very important that we understand that, that the the spiritual food is what is going to provide maturity. And guys, there's some of us, honestly, we're spending more time watching the office reruns than we are spending time with God. And guys, this isn't me just like coming in here, slapping people around. Like I watch the office too. But there comes a point that our life will reflect what's coming in. And part of spiritual maturity is taking in spiritual nutrition. We gotta move past the milk. If the only thing you're getting is what you're getting here this morning, you're probably spiritually immature. And I'm not, this, I'm just saying that, and like, I don't know the situation. I just know that this is not enough. I gotta, I gotta move on. And I'm gonna, I'll, I'll just share the la, the, this last thing and, and then I'm gonna bring us to close. Is having my way more essential than unity? Check engine light. Is having my way more essential than unity? Because we're gonna see this later, but it definitely we're seeing it here already in the first three chapters. What's at the heart of this is us fighting over our preferences rather than standing for our convictions. Now, I know that sometimes it's hard for us to, to, to figure out the difference because we all have preferences. And some of you think that your preferences are holier than your neighbor's preferences. I think it's very important that we ask this question because Paul's gonna address this later in 1 Corinthians. In fact, this week, continue to study through 1 Corinthians chapter three because man, it's, it's gonna bring some things up. But is what you're all caught up in and what gets you fired up and what causes this like tension within you, are they the things that are gonna really matter in eternity? Because we talked about this a little while ago in, in Life Group the other night. Um, I wonder if what matters most to us today is what matters most to God. Seriously, like we fight about stupid things. You know, who wrote the Bible study? Uh, who, what kind of songs are we singing? What are we doing? That? Literally, like if, it's like if it has to be about your way when it comes to music or what, you're gonna struggle in heaven. I'm just telling you, you're not gonna be happy. So, uh, you know what I'm saying? Is, is what matters us, to us today what matters in eternity? And here's what Paul's gonna tell us. He says there's coming a day, and this is Christians that he's talking to. When all of our works, all the things that we, that we were striving for here, there's gonna be a fire that God's going to send on those things. And he said, those things that are chaff, that are straw, hay, stubble, it's going to be consumed the only thing that we will carry with us into heaven are those things that were eternal. Immaturity is caught up in doing things my way where maturity is us being submitted to doing things God's way. It really, at the, at the end of the day, if immaturity's motto is it's all about me, 
Spiritual maturity's motto is this, it's all about Christ. Really, that's what, it, that's what it's gonna come down to. In fact, th- this is just as Matt's message last week was foundational to the series. This is just building on this. This is foundational as well. Because what we're gonna see as we go through 1 Corinthians, uh, th- this is at the heart of it. It has to be all about Christ. In fact, by the time we get to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, man, we're, we're gonna see that the work Christ did on the cross, his resurrection, that is what matters above all. But spiritual maturity, guys, is if those check engine lights have come on for you like they have for me recently, it's gonna be begin by acknowledging three things that Paul's gonna hit here. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time breaking this down. Verses 10 through 11, our foundation has to be Christ. The second thing that he wants us to understand when it comes to spiritual maturity is that whatever your foundation is, you're building something on that foundation. And what you're building is only going to be as sturdy and as solid as your foundation. The third thing is this, any maturity that takes place, any holiness that is developed is not about you and what we did. It's because we are God's temple and the Holy Spirit is dwelling in us and he is changing us and maturity is coming because we didn't just settle for pretty check engine light, orange lights on our spiritual dashboard, but we said, I'm not gonna ignore it. I'm not gonna get frustrated with it. I'm going to acknowledge it And by God's help and by God's grace, I'm gonna do something about this. You see the antidote for spiritual immaturity, if you wanna kill spiritual immaturity, literally the antidote is humility. I'm not talking about this false humility where like when I was in Bible college, people would walk around like they were 80 years old. Oh, oh, it's like, dude, you are 19, come on. I, like I have no time for that. Okay, that's not this fake, that's actually just another manifestation of spiritual pride. No, humility is awareness. It's It's an awareness that without Christ, I am nothing. It's an awareness that without Christ, I have nothing. It's an awareness that without Christ, I can achieve nothing. But again, as those spiritual check engine lights come on, it's not God punishing you, disciplining you, or saying you're not good enough to be part of this. It's God in his grace saying, oh man, I've got something better for you. I love you enough to not keep you where you are. There's more, follow me. And so God, in your grace, I believe you've spoken to us today. I believe you're gonna continue to speak to us in the days and weeks to come as we continue the series through this incredible letter. Dear God, I pray that you would grow us. Thank you for loving us enough to not... To, to not keep us where we are. Thank you that, we'll ne- that, that you're gonna finish the work one day. You're still doing the work now. Father, would you help your kids to grow into the name that we've already been called, saints. And God, may we not find our pride in what we've done. May we find our confidence in what you've done and for what you're gonna continue to do, we'll thank you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen.